Yo people, today I want to talk to you about what I consider to be the exercises that had the most impact on my physique over my many years of training. So maybe you will find that somewhat interesting. Maybe I can convince you to incorporate these exercises into your training routine if you're not already. Or maybe it's all just one big waste of time. Who knows? You decide, vote with your attention and with your thumbs up button or not. So before we dive into them, I have got to just go through a couple of very quick but very necessary disclaimers. Right, first of all, this wasn't a fair test. For it to be one, I would have had to clone myself and then live a 15 year period keeping all aspects of life and training exactly the same, aside for swapping out the exercises that I'm about to mention for others, right? And then we could compare them and it would be great. We might, we might get published in The Lancet, right? Obviously, we do have certain biological and temporal limitations upon us that forbid us from doing such an experiment. I will, however, try and give some justification for why I think these exercises are, quote unquote, the best, if you will forgive my very unscientific terminology. Second of all, we are all different, right? And don't worry, you haven't stumbled across body positivity YouTube, right? I'm not about to start saying you know, no one is you and that is your power, right? I mean that we are all somewhat mechanically different in the sense that we have different skeletal proportions and different muscular insertions and these might make us better or less suited, more or less suited to particular exercises. For example, femur length can impact how well suited you are to a squat and things like your arm length in comparison to your torso and legs can make you better or worse at deadlifting. You can think about that in quite a basic sense, right? If I'm bending down to pick a bar up off the floor and I have long arms, I don't have to bend down as far to get that bar, right? Especially if my torso and legs are shorter, right? So it really is that simple, right? Obviously, from a mechanical point of view, the length of a bone becomes the length of a lever when it is involved in a movement. So. Typically, again, people with short femurs might be more suited to squatting. And so squats and deadlifts are the typical examples that you'll see, but this must be true of other exercises as well. I say all this because I don't want you to think that what I say is gospel. Right? Hopefully, what I'm about to say will be helpful to you. I hope it is. But your experience might not necessarily map perfectly onto my experience. So certainly look at it objectively. All right, that's a long enough rambling intro. Let's just get into it. So I'm going to cover six exercises. That's going to be one of each of what I would say are the six fundamentals to any lifting program. So we're going to have a leg press type movement, a hip hinge slash deadlift type movement, horizontal push, horizontal pull, vertical push and vertical pull. So the first exercise on the list is Bulgarian split squats. I've typically done these with dumbbells, but more recently got into using a barbell. For the purposes of this video, we can treat them as interchangeable, which you should do really just depends on which you find more comfortable. These are a unilateral exercise, which is the technical term for doing one side at a time. That's good because it means if you have a stronger side, like most people do, you can't depend on that side to move the weight whilst the other gets less than its fair share of work. So in theory, it should help with a more even development. I'd say if you have room for two leg press type movements in your weekly schedule, make at least one of those a unilateral leg press like split squats, lunges or single leg press. And personally, if I was doing only one leg press movement, then I would still prioritize unilateral. I think split squats are a more typical movement than your usual squat or leg press. A Bulgarian split squat is really just a lunge with extra range of motion. And all a lunge is, is an exaggerated step. So for me, it feels more akin to everyday movements like walking upstairs or climbing a ladder. I don't climb a ladder every day, but anyway, that might be a bit pseudoscience-y, so let me move on. A final point not so related to the physique is that I feel they help with my mobility. On a leg press, you can find that your pelvis rotates through the posterior. When this happens with a squat, people call it butt wink. This can't really happen on a Bulgarian split squat because of your stance, so you just go as far as you can and then that's it. There's no compensating for a lack of mobility with form adaptations slash cheating. On top of that, your hip flexor on the resting side is always getting a nice stretch through each rep. As you get more experience, you will find you are able to get deeper into them and that's your mobility improving without ever having to hold a stretch and count to 30. Next up, Romanian deadlifts, going with the Eastern European theme. 
Now, as a posterior chain movement, I think these are superior to conventional deadlifts for a few reasons. In fact, it's gonna be controversial, but I would say the only thing conventional deadlifts are the best for is getting better at conventional deadlifts. Sure, they can be enjoyable, and you certainly can build muscle doing deadlifts, conventional or sumo, but any muscle group you want to specifically target with conventional deadlifts can be targeted better with another exercise. And if we're talking generally about lower back, glutes and hamstrings, I would say RDLs are superior. The hip hinge part of the movement goes through a far greater range of motion because your legs are pretty much locked. So your ass is actually up in the air as opposed to with a conventional or sumo deadlift where you're trying to actually sit down before pulling so that you can begin your pull with a more upright spine, i.e. less hip flexion throughout the rep. That's because your muscles are at their weakest at their most stretched position. So if you want to deadlift a heavy weight, you try and avoid that position. However, if you want to strengthen and build those specific muscles, then you want the resistance at that point in the movement. The nature of the movement also forces you to use a much slower tempo, which can help you focus more on your technique and achieve a better mind-muscle connection, if that's something you find helpful. If you think about the concentric and eccentric phase of a deadlift, you typically pull the concentric as fast as possible and then just drop the weight, so there isn't really an eccentric phase at all. If you did that for any other exercise, people would think you're pretty crazy. And finally, much like the Bulgarian split squats, I'd say these qualify as an active stretch and can contribute to better mobility. All right, let's move on to upper body exercises. I'm gonna go with a pull-up slash weighted pull-up for this one. I don't think I need to spend too long on this, so I'll just be quick. First, a pull-up is pretty much covering your whole back, albeit with less emphasis on your upper traps, but I'm personally okay with that because I see them as more of a bodybuilder type physique muscle, and I personally don't think big traps is particularly aesthetic. They do hit your lats, rear delts, lower and mid traps, and rhomboids to some extent. If I only had time to do one pull exercise, in the vertical or horizontal plane, I would choose pull-ups because I think they cross over more into the horizontal pull than vice versa. I think a neutral grip tends to allow the greatest force production, at least when I do weighted pull-ups. That's what enables me to shift the most weight. All right, nothing much to say here, just putting this in for completeness. I think both dumbbell press and barbell bench press have their merits. I can't say I personally prefer one over the other to any significant extent. All right, let's move on to the vertical press. And for this, I'm just going to call it an unsupported OHP or overhead press. So that could be your standing barbell OHP or a seated dumbbell press on a flat bench, or even to some extent, a seated Smith machine OHP on a flat bench. The problem with performing your overhead presses on an upright or almost upright bench is that there's a tendency for people to push back into that support arch their backs and press from out wide, which massively emphasizes the anterior delt and reduces the work the lateral head is doing. Your front delts are already getting smashed with all your flat and inclined chest work. Nobody realistically has trouble hitting their front delt. It's the lateral head, or what we call the side delt, that people struggle to engage. And for this, I think an unsupported overhead press is the superior exercise choice. Even when pressing a bar with a narrow grip, you might think that it's still quite front delt focused, and for sure, the early part of the rep is, but when you don't have the back support, you have to press directly above your head to keep your center of gravity in line so you don't fall over. And that means that as soon as you pass your face, you're almost pressing backwards. So the second half of the movement is like a high face pull, which engages the lateral head. For this reason, I would say that unsupported overhead presses are likely superior to any supported alternatives. Finally, let's deal with our horizontal pull exercise. Again, I'm just gonna give you a general type of exercise and some examples. So that is the chest supported low to mid row. So examples would include the seal row, chest supported T-bar row, or any chest supported row machine that allows for a low narrow grip. Rowing with a pronated grip and your elbows flared tends to put more emphasis on upper traps, rhomboids, and rear delts, whereas I would personally rather engage my mid to lower back and lats, as with a more neutral grip, low row. The reason I emphasize having chest support is because I think it allows you to focus on the actual row, rather than expending a lot of energy having to brace your core and lower back on a cable row, pendlay row, or an unsupported T-bar row. Don't get me wrong, a pendlay row is a great exercise, I just don't think it's the best for development because of the position that you have to maintain for the rep. There's a lot of tension on your posterior chain with a pendlay or unsupported T-bar row, and I would prefer not to be adding onto the fatigue that I'll already experience from my RDLs, etc. In simple terms, I think it interferes too much with the rest of my training. 
You'll know what I mean if you've ever done heavy unsupported T-bar rows the day after hitting legs. Yo people, I'm finishing this video on a balcony in Crete. There's probably gonna be Cretan, Cretan sounds in the background. It's fine, let's all carry on. So, if I had to only do six exercises for the rest of my life and try and build a physique, then those are the six that I would choose. Now, luckily, we're not actually in that situation and it is probably beneficial. I'm sure I've seen a study somewhere. I'm not sure if you can say that in a YouTube video though. <laughs> I think it is beneficial to have quite a good selection of exercises in your program, right? However, for those six core compounds, the push-pull in the horizontal and vertical plane, the hip hinge and the leg press movement, I hope I have convinced you at least to try out the ones that I've mentioned right, or the variations that I've mentioned at least. So, if you have any decent ones, I nearly put tricep dips in there, I didn't. If you have any sick ones that you think I've missed, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I hope that was somewhat helpful and I hope this Greek traffic isn't too distracting. See you later. They see me rolling. They hating. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Joey Lenny is my hero.